We are so happy to have all of you joining us tonight for Medieval Women's Voices, a look into the lives and experiences of four very special women through their own voices. The Women's Voices series began in 2015. Often the program complements the spring exhibit of archives and special collections. This year's exhibit, Beneath the Banner of the Cross, the Global Vision of the Early Jesuits, which is right outside our door, by the way, delves into the Jesuits' global mission since the canonization of Jesuit founders St. Ignatius of Loyola and St. Francis Xavier 400 years ago. Our response for this year's program was to focus the spotlight on the medieval women of Catholicism with a special nod to Teresa of Avila, who was also canonized at that time. We would ask you to please mute your cell phones because this is a special program. Uh, we always like our programs to begin with a land acknowledgement, so here we go. It is important to note that we welcome our guests onto land that is not ours. We sit tonight on the unceded lands of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, who in the face of ongoing settler colonialism, continue to claim their place and act as steward of their ancestral lands as they have for the past 8,000 years. These lands reach from the Pacific Ocean, where we stand today, well into what is now San Bernardino County. The whole of the Los Angeles Basin is unceded territory. I would ask you all to take a moment to and spend some time thinking about what it would mean to take responsibility for one's presence on stolen land. I also encourage you to learn more about the history of the land where you sit by going to native-land.ca. As you all know, we don't do this kind of program alone. We are very grateful for the support of our administrators, Dean Robin Crabtree, Dean Bryant Alexander, and of course our own Dean Christine Brancolini for their support. We also want to extend thanks to the Theological Studies Department, the Theater Arts Department, and the Center for Mission and Identity for their support. My favorite part of the job is collaborating with such talented and enthusiastic experts. In the beginning is the word, and Dr. Anna Harrison has given us such beautiful texts to work with. She will introduce and set the stage for each of our four women. Anna Harrison is a professor in the Department of Theological Studies. She teaches classes in the history of Christianity from its Mediterranean origins through the Western European Middle Ages. Professor Harrison is the author of a forthcoming book on the largest collection of women's writing in the 13th century entitled Thousands and Thousands of Lovers, Sense of Community Among the Nuns of Helfta. She is also currently at work on Paradox, Bernard of Clairvaux's On Loving God and Its Influence, which examines notions of love and place of paradox in the thought of one of the most important and influential thinkers of the 12th century Renaissance. Dr. Stacy Sabai has, creative, has creatively and enthusiastically directed our four extremely talented student actors for tonight's performance. Stacy is our fellow, faculty fellow of Mission and Identity, she is an American fellow in the AAUW, which is the American Association of University Women, and an award-winning performing artist. As a professor of theater arts, Stacy teaches a wide range of courses on performance and pedagogy. In the fall of 2022, she's teaching Introduction to Theater Pedagogy, Voice Development, and a new undergraduate course, Care for the Whole Artist. After meeting the women, we will have a question and answer portion where you will be able to ask questions of all six of our participants. But before we begin, I would like to share a question from one of tonight's women, Julian of Norwich, which really spoke to me. She said, just because I am a woman, must I therefore believe that I must not tell you about the goodness of God when I saw at the same time both his goodness and his wish that it should be known? So I will now turn over the program to Dr. Anna Harrison.
Good evening. From about the 12th through the 16th century, Western European women contributed to shaping both Catholic intellectual history and the pious practices that came to characterize this period of Catholic religiosity, with its focus on the humanity of Christ, its fierce Eucharistic devotion, and its bold assertions about the role of the body in relating to God. Women did so in spite of efforts to curtail their education, public address, and writing. Many women whose words come down to us from these centuries made claims to vision and ecstasy. Many adopted a posture simultaneously humble and audacious, insisting that the words and insights they offered were not their own, but came to them directly from Christ, Mary, or the saints, and that they, the women, were merely vessels relating what had been taught to them by God, his family, and his friends. Women in this period thus found creative means by which to bypass prohibitions on their public communication and insert themselves into contemporary theological discourse. In today's event, we hear the voices of four of the most significant women writers from our period. Each contributes her writings in English, Spanish, and Latin to matters central to the Catholic intellectual tradition. We'll hear from two nuns, that is women who lived in monasteries, same-sex communities whose members are bound by obedience, whose lives are governed by a set of guidelines administered by an abbess, a head of household, and who spent the bulk of their lives in sung communal prayer. We'll also hear from an anchoress, a woman who lived sequestered in a small room attached to a church. And we hear, finally, from a woman who spent her life in her family's urban home. Three of the four women are venerated as saints. That is, they are recognized by the institutional church as worthy of praise for their exceptional holiness. The same church has proclaimed these three doctors of the church, an honor bestowed on those who are thought to have made singularly important contributions to Catholic teaching. The fourth woman, Julian, uh, has received neither recognition, we might ask why. We begin with Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard was a polymath, an abbess of a socially and intellectually elite monastic community in Germany. Hildegard underscored the importance of obedience and communal prayer. She helped to shape the ecclesial system she supported as a visionary theologian who claimed her knowledge of scripture and of theology came to her directly from God in fiery revelations. Hildegard, who may have believed herself to be the very first woman writer, was 43 years old when she began to compose an astonishing, on an astonishing range of topics, producing an encyclopedia of medicine and natural science, a trilogy combining theology, ethics, and cosmology, a liturgical play, over 70 hymns, two saints' lives, and several hundred letters. Hildegard was also a preacher who inserted herself into the thick of controversial church politics, advocating for the reform of the priesthood that emphasized clerical sexual purity and priestly power. She chastised and directed popes and emperors, prophesied the world's imminent end, and dispensed advice on matters domestic and divine. The elusive notion of veriditas is threaded throughout almost all of Hildegard's writings. 
a word that has been variously translated as greenness, verdance, verve, and verdant. To Hildegard, it seems to have meant something like the creative, sustaining, healing, and salvific power of the divine that is visually evident in plant life and that moves throughout the whole of creation, including human beings, both body and soul. No creature, Hildegard heard God say to her, among the growing creatures grows unless its greenness binds it together. No form is able to exist unless it is from me. I am their verdure. Hildegard wrote and preached on verditas in part to combat the assertion that the material world is evil, a teaching that was gaining much traction in the 12th century, and which Hildegard denounced as contrary to Catholic teaching on the goodness of creation. In 2012, Hildegard was declared a doctor of the church, in large part, I believe, on account of the painstaking scholarship of Barbara Newman, professor at Northwestern University, whose translation and broader study of Hildegard's enormous body of work in the 1980s brought the 12th century nun worldwide attention, an indication of the power of meticulous and patient scholarship to effect change. Hildegard is the patron saint of writers and musicians and of environmental movements who have taken up her teachings on veriditas to acknowledge the wonder of creation and its power to communicate. As you entered the room this evening, two of Hildegard's hymns were playing, and you will now hear them in translation. O Green Finger of God is a hymn for Advent, which the nuns in Hildegard's monastery would have sung together to celebrate in anticipation Christ's incarnation, that is, God becoming human. Noblest Green Veridity likewise speaks to the incarnation. Oh, noblest green veridity. You are rooted in the sun and in the clear, bright calm. You shine within a wheel no earthly excellence can comprehend. You are surrounded by the embraces of the service the divinities, the mysteries, divine. As morning's dawn, you blush. As sunny flame, you burn. Oh, green finger of God. In you, God planted a heavenly vineyard that glistens like a pillar of light. You are glorious as you prepare for God. And oh, height of the mountain, which will not be destroyed by the judgment of God. Yet you stand far away, exalted one, like an exile, but it is not in the power of an armed man to seize you. You are glorious as you prepare for God. Glory to the Father, Spirit, and the Son. You are glorious as you prepare for God.
Julian was an anchoress in Norwich, England. After prayers for the dead were said over her, an anchoress withdrew to a small room called a cell and was walled in for life, becoming dead to the world. Yet anchoresses were, paradoxically, very much engaged with the larger community, who were larger community, who perceived the choice to withdraw as an indication of holiness. Anchoress's cells were typically equipped with two windows, one through which they dispensed advice to townspeople, and another through which they could view mass, the central religious ritual of the Catholic late Middle Ages. We know almost nothing about Julian's life. With the exception of a near-death experience, she recounts in her showings one of the theological masterpieces of the Middle Ages in which Julian elaborates a notion of Jesus as mother, glories in Christ's bloody crucifixion, and presents an account of the fall that stands apart in the Western European Christian tradition. As Julian lay on her deathbed, so we read, a group of people gathered around her and a priest held a crucifix before her eyes. The man on the cross seemed to Julian to come alive, and a series of visions or showings followed. In the common medieval version, Adam and Eve fell when they succumbed to the temptation of the devil, who promised them divine wisdom and power if they would eat fruit from a tree forbidden to them. God punished Adam and Eve for their disobedience. They lost the happiness and immortality of the body that would have belonged to them and were separated from God. In Julian's retelling of the story, God is a Lord and Adam is the Lord's loyal and loving servant. Here, the servant's fall, which stands in for Adam's fall, is a consequence not of disobedience, but of the servant's eagerness to please. As Julian relates, the Lord never ceases to remain close to his servant. Unaware of his Lord's loving presence, however, the servant suffers great pains. The Lord does not punish his servant, but promises him great rewards for his good fall. Julian writes, I saw two persons in bodily likeness, that is to say, a Lord and a servant. And with that, God gave me spiritual understanding. The Lord sits in state, in rest and in peace. The servant stands before his Lord respectfully, ready to do his Lord's will. The Lord looks on his servant very lovingly and sweetly and mildly. He sends him to a certain place to do his will. Not only does the servant go, but he dashes off and runs at great speed, loving to do his Lord's will. And soon he falls into a dell and is greatly injured. And then he groans and moans and tosses about and writhes, but he cannot rise or help himself in any way. And of all this, the greatest hurt which I saw him in was lack of consolation, for he could not turn his face to look on his loving Lord, who was very close to him, in whom is all consolation. But like a man who was for the time extremely feeble and foolish, he paid heed to his feelings and his continuing distress, in which distress he suffered seven great pains. The first was the severe great bruising which he took in his fall, which gave him great pain. The second was clumsiness of his body. The third was the weakness which followed these two. The fourth was that he was blinded in his reason and perplexed in his mind so much so that he had almost forgotten his own love. 
The fifth was that he could not rise. The sixth was the pain most astonishing to me. And that was that he lay alone. I looked all around and searched, and far and near, high and low, I saw no help for him. The seventh was that the place in which he lay was narrow and comfortless and distressful. I was amazed that this servant could so meekly suffer all this woe, and I looked carefully to know if I could detect any fault in him or if the Lord would impute to him any kind of blame. And truly, none was seen, for the only cause of his falling was his good will and his great desire. And in spirit he was as prompt and good as he was when he stood before his Lord, ready to do his great will. Then this courteous Lord said this, See, my beloved servant, what harm and injuries he has had and accepted in my service for my love, yes, and for his good will. Is it not reasonable that I should reward him for his fright and his fear, his hurt and his injuries and all his woe? And furthermore, is it not proper for me to give him a gift better for him and more honorable than his own health could have been. Otherwise, it seems to me that I should be ungracious. Catherine of Siena was born into a prosperous and large family. She had 24 siblings. Hearing the screams of her mother in labor may have contributed to Catherine's dedication to a life of virginity. <laughs> An appealing option for many medieval women who generally did not have the opportunity to choose whether or whom to marry. Remaining all her life in her parents' home, Catherine immersed herself among the large population of urban poor in her native city of Siena, Italy, where she tended to the sick and dying, fed the hungry, and pled the cause of condemned prisoners. Catherine received no formal education. She harnessed the authority that accrued to her from visionary encounters with Christ to inflame, counsel, and exhort, and to address matters of pressing theological significance. Her fervor thrust her into the arena of power politics, and the scope of her activities was, for a woman, largely without precedent. She became a major player in international church affairs, was appointed advisor to a pope, and like Hildegard, Catherine has been declared a doctor of the church. Medieval Catholics, like their modern counterparts, regarded Christ as fully human and fully divine and asserted that Christ is key to our salvation. How Christ saves has been variously understood throughout Christianity's 2,000-year history. Catherine in keeping with her broader culture, locates salvation largely in our response to Christ's death. But whereas many of Catherine's predecessors and contemporaries emphasize that our attraction to Christ is compelled by the recognition of the love that moved him to give up his life in the crucifixion, what attracts Catherine is the passion itself, the arduous suffering leading up to and including the crucifixion, Christ's death on the cross. Christianity long affirmed that imitating Christ is key to becoming pleasing to God. In Catherine's time, we see an increasing preoccupation with imitating Christ in his physical suffering. Catherine considered herself to be imitating Christ when she experienced unavoidable everyday discomforts, such as headaches and backaches. 
and in the hunger she cultivated through extreme fasting that probably triggered the heart attack that killed her when she was 33. Through such imitation, Catherine understood herself to become one with Christ's body. But why does Catherine focus on the body in pain? The answer is that for Catherine, our body is in some sense our humanity and bodies suffer. To Catherine, our aches, bleeding, and hunger pangs are who we are. But this experience of embodiment distances us from God, who is not constrained by the limitations of the body. That's why for Catherine, the bridge joining us to God must take the body into account. For Catherine, Christ is that bridge, and what is most significant in Christ's assumption of our humanity is his taking on of the burdens associated with the flesh. In order to lift up, to save the whole person, God must become a whole person. And by joining with his body in imitation of his sufferings, Catherine taught, we are lifted into his divinity. We are saved, our suffering rendered meaningful. To a group of Southern Italian women, Catherine writes, Dearest mother and sisters and sweet Jesus Christ, I, Catherine, slave of the slaves of Jesus Christ, write to you in his precious blood with desire to see you confirmed and perfect charity, so that you be the true nurses of your souls. For we cannot nourish others if we do not first nourish our own souls. Do as the child does, who wanting to take milk, takes the mother's breast and places it in his mouth and draws to himself the milk by means of the flesh. So we must attach ourselves to the breast of the crucified Christ, in whom we find the mother of charity, and draw there by means of his flesh, that is, the humanity, the milk that nourishes our soul. For it is Christ's humanity that suffered, not his divinity. And without suffering, we cannot nourish ourselves with this milk, which we draw from charity. God says to Catherine, according to her book, The Dialogue, I want you to look at the bridge of my only begotten son. Notice its greatness. Look, it stretches from heaven to earth, joining the earth of your humanity with the greatness of the Godhead. This is what I mean when I say it stretches from heaven to earth through my union with humanity. This was necessary if I wanted to remake the road that had been broken up so that you might pass over the bitterness of the world and reach life. From earth alone, I could not have made it great enough to cross the river and bring you to eternal life. earth of human nature by itself, as I have told you, was incapable of atoning for sin and draining off the pus from Adam's sin. For that stinking pus had infected the whole human race. Your nature had to be joined with the height of mine, the eternal Godhead, before it could make atonement for all of humanity. Then human nature could endure the suffering, and the divine nature joined with that of humanity would accept my son's sacrifice on your behalf to release you from death and give you life. Having attended a school for children of the Spanish nobility, 
Teresa was 20 when, against her father's wishes, she entered the Monastery of the Incarnation in Avila. Teresa was a bookish woman, and her voracious appetite for literature, coupled with her rigorous prayer life, provided the platform from which, as an older woman, she soared into a series of extraordinary experiences, including, so she claims, hearing Christ speak directly to her and beholding the Trinity. She also related a terrorizing vision of hell. These visions fuel Teresa's desire to promote Catholic teachings. She supported efforts underway to evangelize India and fight the growth of Protestantism. Teresa founded monasteries throughout Spain in the process, both collaborating with and fighting against the Spanish king, princesses, and university professors. As was common for nuns, Teresa spoke regularly with male spiritual directors, a number of whom suspected the visions she related came not from God, but from the devil. In an effort to better communicate these experiences, Teresa wrote the autobiographical book of her life, which circulated widely and drew to her side a range of women and men, including Jesuits, who sought her spiritual counsel. The book also attracted the attention of the Inquisition, whose job it was to ferret out so-called heretics, that is, those who taught beliefs they perceived to run counter to Catholic teachings. When inquisitors suppressed the book of her life, Teresa, at the command of her own confessor, set out to write a new book, The Interior Castle, in which she recounts the access to her inner self that she discovered through a lifetime of prayer, a plunge into interiority that she encourages in her readers. Thus, like many women between the 14th and 16th centuries, including Catherine of Siena, Teresa was during her lifetime both hailed for her holiness and feared as an instrument of the devil, both praised and persecuted. She was declared a saint in 1622 and a doctor of the church in 1970. The following is the very first passage from Teresa's interior castle. Today, while beseeching to our Lord to speak for me, because I couldn't find anything to say, nor did I know how to begin to carry out this obedience. There it came to my mind what I shall now speak about. that which will provide us with a basis to begin with. It is that we consider our soul to be like a castle made entirely out of a diamond or of a very clear crystal. In which there are many rooms. Just like in heaven, there are many dwelling places. For in reflecting upon it carefully, sisters, we realize that the soul of the just person is nothing more than the paradise when, where the Lord says he finds his delight. So then, what do you think that abode will be like where a king so powerful, so pure, so wise, so full of all good things, takes his delight. There is nothing comparable to the magnificent beauty of the soul and its marvelous capacity. Indeed, or intellects, however keen, they cannot comprehend it, just as they cannot comprehend God. But he himself says, that he made us in his own image and likeness. Well, if this is true, as it is, 
There is no reason to tie ourselves on trying to comprehend the castle, since this castle is a creature. And the difference, therefore, between it and God is the same as in between the Creator and its creature. His Majesty, in saying that the soul is made in his own image, makes it almost impossible for us to understand the sublime beauty and dignity of this soul. It is a shame and unfortunate that through our own fault, we don't know ourselves or know who we are. Wouldn't it show great ignorance, my daughters? That if someone was asked who he was, didn't know? Didn't know his father or mother or from what country he came? Well, if this would be so extremely stupid, we are incomparably more so when we do not strive to understand who we are. But limit ourselves to considering only roughly these bodies. Because we have heard, and because faith tells us so, we know we have souls. But we seldom consider the precious things that can be found in the soul or who dwells within it, or its high value. Consequently, little effort is made to preserve its beauty. All our attention is taken up with the plainness of a diamond or of the wall of the castle. That is, with this body of ours. Well, let us consider that this castle, as I said, has many dwelling places. Some are up above, others are down below. But in the middle and center is where the main dwelling place, where the secret between God and the soul take place. This is Teresa Arraf, who was Teresa Avia, Avia sorry. Jen Robbins was Hildegard of Bingen, Victoria Martinez as Duane of Norwich, and Kaliana Stell as Kalina, thank you, as Catherine of Siena.
So, uh, hopefully some of you in the audience may have questions for our, our performers as well as our two scholars. Uh, does anybody have questions yet? And if you would stand so I can hear your question and then I will try to uh, say it out loud to everybody to repeat it. This is a more general question, but I think uh, the university could use its class like on women in its in space because I feel like a lot of our history is kind of ignored when teaching about Catholic faith. And I was wondering if I do believe that you would like to answer that one. That was, <laughs> so could there I, be a, a could there be a course of women of faith? By all means, uh, and I, I might actually be happy to do so if there's some interest. I did teach a, such a course, but that was a few years ago. But uh, I, I think that's a lovely idea, and I will take it under advisement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled for your interest, by the way. I'm, that's wonderful. <laughs> There's a few of us who could pull it off in, in, in our department. <laughs> Any other questions? Cynthia. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who is there, because I was in tears from the, the first performance on, and I really, really um, feel very moved by it. Very, very big question. Um, you made time fall away from me, and I'm wondering whether this experience as a working with you professor, um, the assistant director, assistant actor, but also for based in Anna, helped you to feel more connected to a time that is so distant from us in so many ways. Don't feel like us and our lives um, when we think about just how we go about our daily lives. But this is experience with the words of these women connect with you through the performances and through the work. So, did, how did you connect to the women that you that you are portraying today, given that there's such a distance between you and time? Sure, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> there is one line in particular that Catherine says when she says, you know, how can you nourish others if you first don't nourish your own soul? And I am a new mother to a toddler. So, yeah, so um, having to remind myself on my busy day while in grad school and doing all of these things to stop and pause and nourish my soul first so that I can nourish my sons. Um, really st struck gold for me. I think that's that's timeless. But and not just you know, get rest when you can, or remember to eat today. Um, you know, drink water, but as well as getting connected spiritually um, and grounding myself and reminding myself my, of my whys. And now my son is my new why. So, but I, I need to line all of those things up so that I'm dialed in to do what I need to do every day. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Would <laughs> anybody else like to answer? Um, I, this experience has been so mind blowing for me. Thank you for your question because it was. Stacy and I talked about this. We all talked about it. We were telling Anna to, just the just trying to wrap your head around the way they are thinking. A let alone trying to memorize something. <laughs> um, it was like I told Stacy, it was like when I was in sixth grade and I got glasses, and you put your glasses on, and you're like, oh, you can see color. <laughs> you, you see what green is. You see what, what blue sky looks like. And for me, this has been deeply spiritual, and I, and I, I love what you said about time falling away. Mm. Time f fell away from me, and, and, and it, I, will, I will never be the same. Mm. I will never be the same. And I don't want to take up too much time, but could I read this little thing? Yes, please. It's not a little thing. <laughs> this is, I just want to share this with you because this blew my mind, okay? This is from um, The Divine Works. This is Hildegard talking about veridity, talking about this force. 
I am the supreme fiery force igniting every spark of life. My breath knows nothing of death. I see you as you are and I judge you. I fly through the most distant galaxies of space on wings of wisdom, creating order wherever I go. I'm the divine flame of life. I burn above the golden fields. I sparkle on the water and I shine like the sun, the moon and all the stars. Together with the loving hidden power of the wind, I make everything come alive. Remember that I'm also reason. I inform the wind of the first word that created all things. I'm your branch. I'm the breath of all things. And none die because I am that life. I mean, when you say, like, can we have a class on this? Can we, like, get this into our church somehow? Can this be, like, part of, like, our education, our catechis catechism? Like, this to me was the most magnificent explanation of what the Holy Spirit spirit could possibly be. I, I, I just thank you for your question, and thank you for everyone for being here, because... I mean, this was just such a spiritual, mind-blowing everything <laughs> for me. Thank you. Thank you. Would any of the others like to tackle this one? Shall we move on? Move on. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> Thank you for that direction. You've learned well from Stacy. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Would like to ask any of our participants? Yes. Um, I'm grateful for how each of you were present here content in your text, that you had learned it so that you could um, present to us as well. That's an accomplishment. And there was a sense of gravitas that we were all moved by. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the wonderful aesthetic resonance of the image and your own faces. Did you get to choose them or did Stacy choose them? We did not get to choose them. They were a surprise. Ah, <laughs> maybe uh, the person who chose them would like to address them. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> they were moving, aren't they? Mm. As an artist, I was curious about the legacies of these women. Not only the words they wrote, but the recipes, mm -hmm. yes. the music, and the works, the great works that they've inspired um, in future artists. And so there were so many to choose from. We found, I found, consulting with some of you who are early on in the project, that these four images were particularly evocative, evocative because they they seem like glimpses of moments where the visions are happening. Mm. There is a quality of the penetrating gaze, or in Catherine's seeing beyond, or even in Julia and John and I are talking about this cat, that <laughs> she, with her cat, is envisioning a truer, more beautiful life post-pandemic, because she <laughs> lived through a pandemic as well. <laughs> and in Hildegard, <laughs> There are so many things about this image. I could teach a class on this image, probably, <laughs> like iconography. Um, but in the speech that Anna chose, there is a sense of the wheel. And so I like how that appears in this image, as well as being embraced by the veridity. Mm -hmm. um, Jen and I uh, worked on this piece. Is it okay if I share this? Yeah. <laughs> we um, worked on this piece in a labyrinth. <laughs> at the wow. Mary and Joseph Center in Palos Verdes. Mm -hmm. And so Jen had um, developed a kind of embodiment practice for Hildegard by way of this image. So mm -hmm. as artists, I guess what we're looking for is the things that light us up. And for some reason, these four images were the ones that were our catalysts to giving life to these words. Does that answer speak to your question? Wonderful, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Any other questions here? Yes, sir. Um, I noticed uh, in the letter from Catherine of Siena, um, I was kind of fascinated by referring to oneself as a slave of Christ. I've never really heard that uh, language be 
used to kind of describe your relationship um, with Christ, and I was wondering what significance that added to your letter, that kind of language. Well, sir, <laughs> <laughs> I should have known you would come with a question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I can tell you what I think. Because when I read it, slave of slaves of Jesus Christ, I was like, oh, okay. Um, to me, I think that it means that she is, I don't want to use the word slave, but um, this, this all-consuming, all-loving, compassing, devoted person to those working people that are all devoted to God. She is, she is a giver to those givers, um, as well as the ones that are forgotten or condemned or all those things. But she, she truly sees herself as like, I am just like as low as I can get, just all giving, all encompassing, all loving. Um, that's what it meant to me. <laughs> well, I think maybe something like oh, that. Okay. Cool. And uh, so remember, so she she is worshiping a god whom she conceives of as entirely unconstrained, right? With no constraints, mm -hmm. all good, all powerful, uh, all knowing. And what she tends to emphasize in her religiosity is God's taking on constraints. Uh, for her, especially the constraints of the body. Okay, so this to her is a profoundly humbling act. Okay, so, and then she, of course, is imitating that humility in her own religiosity. Uh, but I think you're right, she in addition, is adding, um, she, in addition, she's doing what, what I think you said, which is she's identifying herself as um, subservient. Um, okay, now humble, not just in relation to her desire to imitation the humble God, mm -hmm. but subservient to these people whom she served, which is no minor matter. I mean, she is serving. Uh, people whose bodies are rotting in the street, mm -hmm. people who are going hungry. She's touching them, she's smelling them, she is, of course, putting her own body in danger by doing so, then she's also serving condemned I mean, She's serving the, the vile members of society. So I think that expression has multiple meanings. One, an expression of humility, which if you think of it, is also an audacious expression. Right. I'm, as, I'm a servant to, to God, imitating him in his humility, but the very claim that's implicit there that she's imitating God is pretty audacious. <laughs> and simul so I think that the text actually has multiple meanings, including the part. It's, it's important not to forget that Catherine really worked in the street with dying and decaying people and simultaneously stood up to popes and emperors and stuff. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. And then I, you know, we tried to convey to you some of what may have fueled her. And probably she was in real need of, of the milk and taking care of herself, if you think of. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the outrageous uh, commitment she made. Yeah. She was probably exhausted. And then she died <laughs> very young. Not surprising she didn't eat. But what a legacy. Astonishing. <laughs> Astonishing yeah. legacy. And we scratch the surface of the writings of medieval women. Scratch the surface. There's enough for a whole class, I think. <laughs> There's enough <laughs> for at least a few decades, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel like I put you on the spot a little bit for a moment. By all just, means. Uh, in that same, that same passage there from Catherine, where we have that uh, extraordinary imagery uh, uh, where she enjoins us to attach ourselves to the breast of the yeah. crucified Christ when we find Mother of Charity. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, that that feminine imagery for Christ you mentioned, Julian, earlier, the, the God and Mother uh, 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 piece, and I think that would be 
good for us to hear a little bit more about, mm -hmm. especially in light of um, you know some recent controversies that we maybe shouldn't talk about here at LMU about you know theologians talking about the gender of God in the classroom as if there is no room for discussion. Oh, in fact, yeah. this is an, a yeah. quite ancient topic in our. It's a very uh, ancient uh, topic, especially I mean, starting in the earliest centuries. There's all sorts of imagery uh, in, in the Western European Christian tradition of God as mother, God as nursing. Uh, there's, um, when we get especially to the 12th century, um, you might say maternal and other feminine imagery for God, uh, particularly for, for Christ, flourishes, interesting, in male monastic settings. That's where it emerges, not first among women. Uh, it explodes in the 13th uh, and 14th century. Julian presents one of the most elaborate considerations of Jesus' mother. Uh, there are earlier considerations where, for example, one of the most, I think, kind of beautiful is Christ is on the cross. His, his, his physical pains are assimilated to labor pains. And uh, Marguerite of Wanye, uh, it's actually a different order, but I can't remember her name, speaks about Christ. Huh? Is it correct? No. No, Marguerite yeah. yeah. Speaks about Christ giving birth to salvation on the cross. So there's tons of female imagery. One of the interesting things is that although the imagery in the Middle Ages really begins in male monastic circles, um, Women and men use maternal and other feminine images for Christ in very different ways. When men use it beginning in about the 12th century, it's often abbots, the heads of these same-sex households. Uh, um, so it's often abbots who talk about Christ as mother as a model for themselves, and they talk about themselves as mother, the abbots, the male head of households, to emphasize uh, their gentleness and their sort of merciful disposition to the brothers, the men for whom they serve as, as head of household, and in contrast with their own abatial or responsibility as abbot to judge and to maintain order and obedience. So when men talk about Jesus as mother, it's in relation to themselves often, Christ as model, in order to present what they, the 12th century monks, conceive of as complementary male and female characteristics. Characteristics that is that the dominant culture tags as female or male. When women talk about Christ as mother, it's very different. It has generally, or often at least, to do with women's own sense of physicality, of themselves as embodied. The larger culture associated women with body, men with spirit, uh, women with emotion, male with rationality, sort of dichotomous associations. What women seem to have done, at least some very magnificent scholars have argued, is taken advantage of their culture's sense of themselves as embodied, as fleshy, as physical, and said, that's right, we're like Jesus, we're like Christ. So they were able to sort of merge with his humanity, which was for them a sort of, uh, if you merge with his humanity, because Christ is fully human and fully divine, you merge with the divinity. So it's a way of them joining the divinity. Uh, but they emphasize with Christ his physicality, especially you see this in Catherine, that what Christ does is he takes on our suffering in its, in, with an emphasis on our physical suffering, labor pains, headaches. Headaches were thought to be a, a way to imitate Christ. So there's tons of imagery, but so important. Wait, it sounds weird. It's amazing. Oh, yes, there's any, I've oh. never liked headaches, but they are. <laughs> no, but think, think of the meaning there for your headache's not wasted. And if you join your headache in imitation of Christ, what does Christ do? He saves the world. So explicit in the writing of women and men in this period that you can contribute to the salvation of the world because you have period pains, because you have... Uh, a broken ankle. As long as you join deliberately, conceive of joining your suffering to God's, 
You're participating in the suffering that saves the universe. So men and female write this way, not just women. But anyway, there's tons of stuff. Wow. Tons of stuff. Good question, John. Uh, yes, Kim. Um, can you tell us some about uh, Teresa and her relationship with Jesuits? Because she was so particular about saying, this is who you should have as spiritual director. Uh -huh. yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Kim, I'm sure you could talk better. Okay. Because I, you know what I know of Teresa is next to nothing. <laughs> Uh, frankly, to be honest, I included her because we were supposed to be in communion with the uh, Jesuits in the other room. <laughs> and I know that some consulted with her, and I know they had shared, you know, missionary impulses. I mean, they were going all around, you know, the fight against Protestantism, Jesuits, Teresa's totally on board, and the desire to evangelize, you know, new lands like India. That's all I got for you. I'm really sorry, but it's true. Kim, would, would, you, like would, you, would you tell us? Would you tell us? Yes. Up for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just know that she, she always wanted her sisters to have uh, spiritual directors that were very smart. Yes. And, and particularly, she always said, and so if you can, make sure it's a Jesuit. Did she? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, well, I will simply add this, if you don't mind. She was in a very delicate situation. And this is also true for Catherine. Uh, but especially, um, uh, so this is the, the period of the, the 16th century Protestant Reformation. There is uh, ferocious antagonism. And in addition, uh, women and men, especially those who are claiming uh, direct contact with God, uh, are being looked at very carefully by the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And she was in enormous danger. Women from the 14th through 16th century are very often uh, perceived sometimes simultaneously as heretics, sometimes witches, mm -hmm. and, and holy women. So she needed someone, I suppose, whom she regarded as smart mm -hmm. because she was so sure, I think, for the most part, of the wholesomeness, uh, the divine origin of much of what she experiences, that she was she was afraid of people who wouldn't be sensitive to the delicacy of her writing, mm -hmm. because it would be misinterpreted. And I think that's part of it. Whether the Jesuits were in a position to do that, I just don't know. Oh, I just want to encourage, um, because you're all artists, there's a lot available for other visual and material cultures with these women, like yeah. Hildegard. Yeah. Um, they're still selling medicines that are inspired by her recipes <laughs> online in Germany. Oh, yeah. And when I was at the Getty Research Institute uh, preparing to speak on Hildegard, there was a handmade book. And as I unfolded it, it was yeah. as long as that counter. And everybody was out because they wanted to touch it too. Yeah. I mean, the at these polymaths, they were all resistors. And I think it's very helpful for women to remember that these women were brave about resisting um, androcentrism and patriarchy and speaking the truth to power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we inherit their legacy. So I'm grateful that you've implemented that for us. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. The book, um, Enduring Grace, is written by Carol Flinders. She wrote The Rose Kitchen. And as someone outside the Catholic Church, she brings their jazziness and their sultry <laughs> humanity alive and mm. takes that gilding off the lily. So mm. enduring grace. Thank you. Yes. On that note, one of the gifts that I brought to the actors today was from St. Hildegard's Kitchen. Oh, yes. Foods of health, oh, foods of joy. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many ways to benefit from <laughs> Thank you. But the women were complicated because they were resisting in some regard very profoundly. But Hildegard was absolutely, for example, affirming the power of the priesthood when that was being questioned, the 12th century is a period when the power of the priest uh, is being promoted by a portion of the Catholic Church, and it's being challenged in other regards. And Hildegard is absolutely in support of what becomes the dominant reform movement 
that gives birth to the expression of the Catholic priesthood that we know today. So just to say... But she was punished because she she buried somebody that was not in grace. They yeah. wouldn't give the whole yeah. man's mass for a year. Yeah, that's, so, yeah, that's yeah, true. She, and she resisted the monks that she was under their authority. And By all means. The whole convent. Yeah. So. This is true, too. Yeah. They're both true. Yeah. They're both true. Yeah, that's the thing. They're both true. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, again, thank you so much for your beautiful performances. Um, but I have a question about Julianne. I believe it was said at the beginning that yeah. she is not an official saint. Um, I never realized that. So I'm curious, that's Dr. Harrison, if you have any ideas as yeah. to why yeah. that's true. I have a couple of ideas. And it's entirely possible that I'm entirely wrong. But one of the things is that uh, Hildegard had a monastic order. Behind her, she was a Benedictine nun. Catherine had uh, an order behind her, the Dominicans. And uh, Teresa was a Carmelite. So they had major institutional support. And in our period, from the 12th century on, it takes massive institutional support to go through, because it's a centralized process around the 12th, 13th century in Rome, to get someone through the process. It's a very complex, long-term, you know, like So Julian didn't have anybody. And we don't know anything about Julian. Um, so she, we don't know much about her. And she has no institutional support system to advocate for her. And then second, there are... There's a particular dimension of her theology that really ran counter to the great bulk of Catholic teaching, and it has to do with the question of universal salvation. So for centuries before Julian, we really don't have much evidence, um, I think going back to the second century, right, going back to origin, of, of support for the notion that she promoted universal, that eventually all of us will be saved. She couldn't bear the notion <laughs> that anybody would be lost. She couldn't imagine a God who would not, vet. she said she didn't know how, and she writes, I know the universal church teaches otherwise, but I think there's, there's something. And so she holds out the hope and almost throws herself behind the notion. So, I mean, that probably might have created problems, should she have, even if she'd had institutional support. But I'm guessing, I don't know about the canonization process. Thank you. Well enough. Yeah. Anyone else, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I would just love to thank all of you for an absolutely lovely, lovely evening. <laughs> had an email thread today about a new word that I learned, but maybe other people know this word. Did you know this word? I did Sela? Oh, which word? S-E-L-A-H. No. Oh, I did not. You didn't? No, no. Okay. I did not. It appears. You do, yes. So can you say it out loud for us? Say it out. What does it mean? To, it's true and to repeat it again. It's, oh. it's worth going on. Mm. That's mm. my understanding. Of That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So I encountered this word that is repeated throughout scripture and um, <clears throat> understood it to mean a holy pause. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so this quality of timelessness that was mentioned here today, this suspension of time, our hope was to create portals for you to vision out over the bluff for whatever future you are dreaming your way into um, and that these offerings, these words from our hearts are invitations to observe some holy pause in this season of the year. Mm. Um, and hopefully to give voice to what you're living your way into because we are so made better um, 
when we amplify the good in all of us. So thank you for being with us and thank you for hearing their powerful voices and for championing their work, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Before you leave, all of you on your seats, you have a very, very, very short um, questionnaire survey. Thank you, John. And we would really appreciate if you would take just a minute or two to fill it out for us because it helps us with our programming in the future. Um, and also, as a gift to all of you on your way out, feel free to grab a treat and not eat it here. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.